Hi, my name is Christopher Malcolm. I'm a Los Angeles-based photographer, director, cinematographer, and writer. And welcome to Movable Canvas, where we have deep discussions about movies, arts, culture, and the stories we live. Paul Newman is one of the most charismatic and charming actors ever to hit the screen. He had that it quality, that presence on screen that made, you know, women want to be with him and men be just like him. His role in the 1963 film HUD, directed by Martin Ritt and photographed by the legendary James Wong Howe, makes use of all of these attributes. One of Newman's defining roles, the character became iconic for a generation of moviegoers, and the film's poster took its place on many young man's wall as an image of aspiration. But here's the thing about the titular character, Hud Bannon. He's kind of an asshole. Now I want to stress up front that I, now when I say that Hud is an asshole, I'm not implying that Paul Newman himself is an asshole. I think it's safe to say that any man that's spent so much of his life really devoted to making other people's lives better through activism through his support for ill children with the hole in the wall gang clamps and uh, his contribution to charity through Newman's own foundation. I think it's safe to say that come judgment day, he was on the right side of the moral ledger. As detailed in the excellent documentary on HBO, The Last Movie Stars, Newman had his own demons to contend with like any man, but he put those demons to good use and service those around him. So how can a man capable of so much good sink his teeth into a character like Hud Bannon who is capable of so much bad? I might even take a step further and say that if we look at Newman's long career, the roles in which he really shined were those when he was asked to play characters whose darker side was a constant threat to overcome the light. Think of characters like Fast Eddie Felsen in The Hustler, Chance Wayne in the, as the manipulative gigolo in, at the heart of Sweet Birth Youth. Heather Crime Family, John Rooney in Road to Perdition, or as an alcoholic lawyer trying to redeem himself in the verdict. The best of Newman's characters all play off the sheer charisma that Newman brought to the table. But the very best made room for the darkness lingering just behind that smile. You totally understand why Hud would be such a ladies' man. One, he looks like Paul Newman. Even as a straight heterosexual male, one has to look at Paul Newman and say, yeah, I, I get it. But more than just the icy blue eyes, Newman had a natural charisma. You can teach someone to act, but you can't teach charisma. It's one of those things you're either born with or not. And Paul Newman had it in spades. On top of all that, as my friends and I were fond of saying when I was in high school, when we'd come across a boy who had a particular skill with the ladies, Hood had game. We'll get to some of the negative manifestations of his pursuit of women later in the essay, but if we take into account Hud's many attempts to seduce the family housekeeper, played brilliantly by Patricia Neal, throughout the film, it's easy to see why it would be hard for a woman to resist. My favorite scene in the film is actually when the drunken Hud Bannon stumbles into Patricia Neal's guest house late at night in an effort to seduce her. It's not like he's genuinely in love with Neal's character, or Alma Brown. Hud isn't really capable of loving anyone but himself. Instead, it's more a matter of convenience that she just happens to be the closest woman available at the moment. Hud enters Elm's guest house under the pretense of wanting a cigarette and wastes no time making his way from the doorway to the bed. The dialogue here crackles as he tries to break down Elm's defenses. The script was written by Irving Ravitch and Harriet Frank based on the book by Larry McMurtry. I haven't read the book, so I'm not sure how much of the dialogue was listed from the book and how much was concocted. For the screenplay so if you know that perhaps you can share in the comments but but the back and forth between the two of them is nothing short of epic and it is a back and forth while this particular essay focuses on paul newman it is vital to realize that it takes two to tango in the seduction scene i just referred to look at neil's performance she plays the scene as a woman who is very used to having passes made at her the practice way in which she deflects hud's advances suggests that this isn't the first time she's had to smile her way out of unwanted attention but the layer beneath the smile, smile suggests that she's not 100% against the idea. She knows she can't sleep with the boss's son, and she's seen enough of Hud to know that sleeping with him would be a bad decision. But she is a woman, and he is a man, and, and dysfunctional as it may be, there are sparks between them. And we can see in her eyes that she is both fighting off Hud externally, while also fighting to subdue her own desires internally. Patricia Neal might not still enjoy the same name recognition as some of her contemporaries, but I've always found her to be one of the most welcome screen presences in Hollywood history. She's deceptively beautiful, and by that I mean she's sexy as hell, while at the same time feeling very much like a real person on screen. You know, her performances don't feel as though she's putting anything on. Her characters feel down to earth and lived in, and that's in the best possible way. Her character in HUD, Alma Brown, is a hardworking woman trying to make the best of her situation. Like many of HUD's other romantic targets, 
Alma's character is also married. The fact that she's apparently estranged from her husband and living with the Bannon family is no excuse for infidelity. Not that she isn't tempted. As she says in the film, the sight of HUD from the kitchen window on a hot summer day has made her set down her dish rag more than once. In a more traditional romance, one could easily see how the story would have progressed in a way that these two wounded souls would find each other and she would be his key to redemption. But HUD Bannon is unredeemable. And for Alma Brown, a woman who has spent her lifetime being hurt by men just like HUD, the warning signs are too big to ignore. But is HUD Bannon really irredeemable? I guess the answer might boil down to whether or not you personally feel that it is, is everyone irredeemable or is there such a thing as someone who's just a bad seed? HUD's own father, Homer, certainly views his son as a lost cause. This animosity may trace back to the death of HUD's brother when the boys were in their teens. HUD feels that his father has never forgiven him and blames him for the accident that led to his brother's death. And it's clear that a large amount of the permanent anger in HUD's nature is a feeling of having had his father turn his back on him. Much of the argument centered around the perceived lack of support given to HUD by his father. This hints at HUD's feeling of perceived favoritism by Homer for the son who died. And HUD's absolute desperation to get even the smallest amount of validation from his father is the key to understanding his perpetual frustration. This is also echoed in the present by Homer's doting on HUD's nephew, Lonnie, played by Brandon DeWile. One can feel the conflict in HUD's relationship with Lonnie and their interaction. He both simultaneously, simultaneously protects the young man while at the same time putting the young man in danger. In our very first introduction to HUD, we find him coming out of the house of a married woman very early in the morning who he's just spent the night with. Lonnie has been sent to fetch his uncle and arrives just about the same time as the woman's husband arrives home. Now, understandably, wondering why these two men are coming out of his wife's room first thing in the morning, the man's a little upset. When he demands to know who has been enjoying the company of his wife, Hud, who is the guilty party, instead blames it on the nephew. Hud does then put himself between the man and his nephew in an attempt to charm his way out of the situation, but had his charm failed, it would have been Lonnie who took the beating instead of Hud. Perhaps he would have stepped in physically to defend his nephew, but with Hud, you're never quite sure. Nor are you sure if Hud's efforts with the boy are meant to protect Lonnie or rather to kind of groom him in his own image. Lonnie looks up to his uncle, as many young boys do. Homer's many warnings that Hud is no one worth looking up to predictably go in one ear and out the other. The innocent Lonnie is still of the age where he wants to see the best in people, and he figures his uncle Hud can't be all bad. But as our story progresses and Lonnie is forced to come face to face with who Hud really is, coming in a decidedly non-consensual attempt by HUD to finally obtain Alma's virtue, he has no choice but to come over to Homer's point of view. So if HUD is so unrepentantly evil and the actions he takes throughout the film are decidedly opposite of our own moral compass, why is the character still so iconic over 60 years since it first hit the screen? Simple, it's Paul Newman. No, not just because he's a handsome movie star with an abundance of charm, it's because Newman is able to imbue his character with such depths behind the savagery. Whether or not he has been falsely blamed for his, ru- for his brother's death is really beside the point. The fact is that Hud's character feels that he is undeserving of the scorn. Or even if part of his character does recognize his own culpability deep down inside, he has long since transformed that guilt into pure anger at his father and the world around him. His innate selfishness destroys the lives of all those around him, but in Hud's mind, he's not being selfish at all. He's living in a cold, every-man-for-himself universe And anybody who isn't doing just the same is just proving themselves to be a fool. Consider the opposing reactions between Hud and Homer to the news of the potential cattle sickness. Consider how he reacts to the very idea of allowing government regulators onto the ranch in the first place. Hud lives by the very simple model, screw them before they can screw you. Paul Newman had a talent like no other to be both an undeniable movie star and an objectively unlikable character at the same time. This sounds easy, but it's not. As moviegoers, we like our heroes and villains to be easily identifiable. Uh, As human beings, we tend to delude ourselves into thinking that any one person can be defined as just one thing. So-and-so is such an amazing singer they can't simultaneously be guilty of this or that crime. This person said there's one horrific thing on Twitter, so that must immediately invalidate the rest of their lives. In the real world, human beings are far more complicated than that. We are neither heroes nor villains. We all live somewhere in between. Newman's gift is bringing us into that gray area by presenting imperfect yet compelling characters. With Hud, he's at the peak of his powers. An amazing performance as a very, very bad man. 
Thanks for watching and for long time subscribers, I apologize for going on a bit of hiatus from making these videos. Life and work got a bit busy, but I put it back into my schedule to share more essays with you in the coming months. So if you enjoyed the video, please do subscribe and hit the like button so you'll be notified the next time a new video drops. And perhaps even more importantly, I'd love it if you share your comments on the film in the comment section. You know, do you think that HUD Bannon is truly irredeemable or merely misunderstood? Why do you think the character has remained so iconic throughout the years despite his many, many failings? Or is it perhaps because of them? I'd love to know your thoughts. Thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you on the next one.